Welcome, uh, uh, Dr. Rothblatt. Uh, every two years, uh, Cassie gathers uh, and to talk about what the most important things that are happening in uh, aerospace technology. And through the years, this is the places where we've learned to make uh, the nice vehicles, engines, and everything that, uh, that Canada boasts today. And so we are holding that tradition. And today, we are very proud to welcome someone who is key in uh, the most important things that are going on in aerospace today. So Dr. Martin uh, Hotblad is chairman and CEO of United Therapeutics, a company she started to save the life of one of her daughters. She leads efforts to create novel therapies for rare diseases, to decode pharmacogenomic properties and medicine, and to manufacture an unlimited supply of transplantable organs. This remarkable person previously created and led Sirius XM as uh, its chairman and CEO, and launched other satellite systems for navigation and international television broadcasting. In the field of aviation, a Sirius XM satellite system enhances safety with real-time digital weather information to pilots in flight nationwide. And she designed the world's first electric helicopter, subsequently setting dual pilot speed, altitude, and endurance records in it. And indeed, she is a very uh, enthusiastic uh, helicopter pilot. Dr. Rothblatt also led the first effort to create transgender health law standards and to protect privacy and autonomy rights in genetic information via an international treaty. She has a bachelor's, a Juris Doctors and MBA degrees from UCLA, a PhD in medical ethics from the Royal London School of Medicine and Dentistry. Her patented invention covers aspects of satellite radio, prostacycline biochemistry, and cognitive software. Have you seen such a wide breadth of interest? Dr. Rothblatt's recent books, which I recommend, are on xenotransplantation, your life of mine, non-binary gender and identity, transgender to transhuman, and cyberetics, virtually human. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Martin to do a presentation uh, to you, after which I'll have a number of questions for this uh, intriguing uh, person. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Fassi, for that uh, beautiful introduction. And it's my great honor and pleasure to be here at uh, CASI. I am a very enthusiastic fan and believer in Canadian aviation, aeronautical, and space technology. So it was an honor for me to be invited to give a keynote address at your annual conference. As uh, Fossey mentioned, I, my current interests revolve very much around the field of organ transplantation. My youngest daughter was diagnosed with a life-threatening rare lung disease while I was running Sirius XM. And there were no medicines approved for her disease. It's called pulmonary arterial hypertension. The doctors told me that no pharmaceutical companies were even working on a cure for this disease because it only affected uh, each year about two or three out of one million people were the incidence of this disease. So it was not of, of uh, commercial interest to, to anyone. And um, the only cure for the disease, the doctors told me, was a lung transplant that in fact, um, after someone received a lung transplant, the disease never came back again. But the uh, problem was that there were very few lungs available um, and many lung diseases that uh, require uh, a lung as the treatment, uh, COPD, cystic fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis, et cetera. 
So uh, the chance of somebody getting a lung was very small. Second, that uh, if you are a child, my, my daughter was uh, not even 10 years old, the chances to get a, a lung that could fit you were even smaller. And um, next, that uh, her disease, it was uh, one, pulmonary hypertension, that the average life expectancy was just three to five years. So she couldn't wait too long for the lung. And last but not least, if you get a lung transplant, it actually is the beginning of another disease, which is a kind of chronic rejection of, of the organ. So I, I decided that um, I, I love satellite communications and aviation, but I felt that uh, life had um, pulled me in another direction. And it pulled me in the direction to try to save my daughter with every bit of uh, ability that I had. So that's uh, what I did. I turned over the reins of uh, Sirius XM. I focused all my energy on uh, two tracks. One, to find a medicine that would uh, halt or at least slow the progression of, of her illness. And secondly, a solution to the shortage of transplantable organs so that um, if, the, if I could not find a medicine or if the medicine didn't work long enough, at least I could have an organ transplant uh, cure. During the time of working on this, I met uh, a couple of other girls my daughter's age uh, with this disease, and I saw it was a really, really uh, sad and, and horrible disease, robbing the, the breath of, of just a, a young child. One of the things I learned in this uh, quest to save my daughter was that only one out of 100 people with uh, end-stage organ disease actually gets a transplant. And I didn't realize the situation was this bad. I realized it was bad. Like I thought maybe one out of three or one out of four. I didn't realize it was this bad. And the reason it's this bad is the vast majority of people with the end stage organ disease, they are not even listed for a transplant. So to give you a numerical example, um, I'm just gonna quote the US figures because they're at the top of my head, but as usual, you could just divide by 10 and you'll get the Canadian figure. So there's about uh, every year in the US, a quarter million people, 250,000, so like 25,000 in Canada, that die of end-stage lung disease. All those ones I mentioned, COPD, emphysema, et cetera, et cetera. But every year in the US, there are only 2,000 lung transplants. And again, in Canada, about 200. So you have maybe a couple more in Canada because Canada is world famous in lung transplantation. The very first lung transplant in the whole world was done at Toronto General Hospital. And uh, also the very first double lung transplant was done at Toronto General Hospital. And it was such a difficult organ to transplant that uh, 15 years passed between the first heart transplant, liver and kidney, before people knew how to do a lung transplant. So that's a, a long time gap. It shows it was very challenging but uh, Canada solved the problem, then quickly replicated worldwide. So 2,000 versus 250,000, it's one in 100. Um, I realized that uh, the solution to this problem was not a matter of getting more people to donate their organs because already 50% of people in the US and in most countries, they agreed to donate their organs. So going from 50% to 100% is not going to take 1% to 100%, right? I mean, it will only double it. So there, I realize that yes, it's very important to agree to donate your organs, but that's not going to solve this 99% uh, gap between the supply and the demand. So the idea came to me, um, why not uh, manufacture transplantable organs? In the meantime, um, I had been able to manufacture a molecule 
that my daughter and everybody else with pulmonary hypertension, their body doesn't make enough of this molecule. And it's one that's coded in your DNA. It, your DNA tells uh, your body how to assemble amino acids into proteins and make this molecule that keeps your lungs healthy. But some people, they, they don't make enough of this molecule. So in my company, we figured out a way uh, very rapidly to make this molecule. Because this molecule has only a very short life in the body, only a couple minutes, it's a molecule that has to be infused 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for your whole life. So I also had to manufacture a new kind of pump that's as small as this uh, remote, and a person could just wear on their belt loop and go about a normal life with this medicine being pumped into their body uh, 24 hours a day. So I thought if I could manufacture kind of the equivalent of a, of a human gland, something that is pumping a molecule into the body, why not also be able to uh, manufacture an organ? And um, if we could do that, then there would be uh, more than 10 times, up to 100 times, the number of transplants. And there would be then also more than 10 times up to 100 times the numbers of uh, organ transplants. The reason I mentioned 10 times here, I mentioned the need is 100 times greater. It's, um, I, I'm an engineering person, so you know, just take it one step at a time. <laughs> 10 time improvement is huge. <laughs> now, all of this occurred uh, during the past uh, 10 or 15 years when the world is becoming more and more aware of the problem of climate change and uh, excess carbon dioxide. As uh, Fossey kindly mentioned, I'm a pilot, so I'm constantly, um, and I'm a helicopter pilot as well. It means I'm constantly flying from gas pump to gas pump. <laughs> That's what we do. So I'm constantly uh, thinking how many pounds of uh, Jet A and how many gallons and um, I'm aware that I'm making, you know, a pretty um, substantial carbon footprint. And I'm thinking to myself, if um, I'm going to increase the number of organ transplants by 10 times or 100 times, this is going to cause a huge increase in the carbon footprint from aviation. Already, uh, we in the aviation industry, we are, we are not insignificant in our contribution to CO2. We provide an uh, you know, a invaluable service. Maybe I will say the greatest service uh, created in the 20th century. And we provide without flying. It's no way for us to solve the problems of the world. But the projections are that the carbon uh, footprint from aviation I think it's now around 5% and will likely double in the next uh, 10 or, or 20 years. So I was thinking at the same time in half of my brain how to manufacture organs to save my daughter and of course everybody else who, who needs them as well. The other half of my brain is trying to say how can I also be a good uh, global citizen and uh, figure out a way to do this without aggravating uh, global warming. So um, again, uh, as an engineer, I tried to do things in a step-by-step -step fashion. And this chart shows that uh, we have developed within my company, United Therapeutics and its subsidiaries, uh, four different methods of manufacturing organs. And each one is uh, simpler than the one after. Um, and each one has a inherent capability to produce fewer organs than the next one, but nevertheless to make a big difference in the supply of transplantable organs. So the, the first one you see on the chart there, it's called a EVLP. And I'm going to show you a video in a moment of how this works. But uh, this technology is, is available, I believe, to increase the supply of transplantable organs um, by the thousands. Uh, probably not the tens of thousands, but by the thousands. 
And I mentioned to you that there's 2,000 transplants of lungs done each year from the organ donations. So if we could increase it by even 2,000 a year, it would double the number of transplantable organs. That's a big deal. Um, that doubles with the chance of somebody like my daughter being able to have her life saved with a transplantable organ. It doesn't do anything about the immunosuppression and the rejection, but at least it gives you a bridge, a chance at life. Now, uh, this technology, uh, EVLP, it's an acronym. It stands for Ex Vivo Lung Perfusion. This technology was also invented in Canada. And um, it's, it's always um, amazing to me how many great things come from Canada and why I'm so proud to have this opportunity to, to share my experiences with this audience in particular. It was invented by Dr. Uh, Shaf Kishavshi at Toronto General Hospital. And um, he has been able to do it just inside the Toronto General Hospital. And I've become uh, friends with Dr. Kishavshi. And I said, what can I do, uh, Dr. Kishavshi, to help expand this technology for everybody? So he said, what's needed is for there to be an expert center, a medical center that has uh, this technology. And whenever there are lungs that are not good for transplant because they've been damaged in a car accident or they've been without uh, blood flow too long uh, before they got to a hospital, that those lungs can be sent to a specialized center. And Martin, if you could uh, take my technology and scale it up so you have several operating rooms with expert technicians constantly working on saving uh, these lungs, that would be the, the best thing to expand my technology. So that's what we've done in our company. I'll show you a video of how it works in a minute. But let me briefly mention that there are three further steps that we'll work on over the next uh, decade. The next one is called Xeno. That uh, means that we modify the genome of the pig. The uh, pig organs, um, if you sacrifice the pig at the age of uh, three to six months, the pig's organs are the same size and shape as an uh, average human organ. And so they can be used as a source of a much greater supply of transplantable organs um, you still have a rejection problem, but it's no worse than the human, the human rejection problem if you modify enough genes on the pig. We've now successfully modified uh, more than uh, 10 key genes on the pig, and we're preparing for clinical trials of these uh, Xeno organs uh, starting in the 2021. So I think that technology can increase by tens of thousands the number of organs. Next up, we have another technology that we call Regen. In this case, we also start with the pig's organs, but we decellularize them, which means we take all of the pig tissues off of the um, uh, scaffold, which is the uh, very delicate framework of every organ. It's uh, made of collagen. Collagen is the most abundant protein produced within our body. And then in a bioreactor, a kind of a, a glass uh, box, we recellularize those scaffolds with human cells. And we could do things with these human cells to make it much less likely for the body to reject the organs. That could increase the uh, supply of uh, transplantable organs up to the hundreds of thousands. It, uh, the patients will still, I believe, need to take some kind of immunosuppression. And we'll be ready to do the clinical trials of that technology by 2025. And then finally, the goal that I'm working the hardest on is uh, what's called um, self-gen. In that case, we take a, we print the scaffold of the organ using 3D printing technologies. And in the case of our company, we 3D print the scaffold, which again is the delicate framework of every organ. We 3D print it with a human collagen, recombinant human collagen, that's uh, grown in genetically modified tobacco plants. Tobacco plants are very good to use for this because they grow rapidly. Uh, biotechnologists are very good at modifying the genome of the tobacco plant. And we already have successfully harvesting collagen from these tobacco plants and 3D printing 
the beginnings, not the entire, but the beginnings of the scaffold for these organs. Then with that 3D printed scaffold, we cellularize the scaffold with the patient's own cells, so it's their own DNA. And we do that by taking a, a cell sample from the patient who will receive the organ, and we turn it back into a stem cell, and then we redifferentiate it into whether it's a cardiac cell or kidney cell, liver cell, lung cell, whatever is the organ to be cellularized, and expand it outside, expand that differentiated cell outside of the body into the many billions of cells needed. Each organ takes about uh, five to 10 billion cells to completely cover it. We then would give that organ to the patient. They won't have to take any immunosuppression. It looks exactly like their organ. And that will give rise to the full demand of uh, people who face end-stage organ disease. That one will take us to the end of the uh, 2020s. But as we all know, in the satellite uh, business and in the uh, aircraft business, 10 years is not a long time uh, to go from a drawing board to, uh, to something that's approved to put people in it and, and, and safely use it. So this is the long-term plan. And um, I'll show you some videos of each step of this plan along the way. Through our lung service model, United Therapeutics currently receives lungs from transplant centers east of the Mississippi River. Our LB1 facility in Silver Spring, Maryland is the first full-service ex vivo lung perfusion center in the U.S., housing six EVLP procedure rooms. Once the lungs arrive at our facility, our CMX system automatically sends a notification to the participating centers, including the OPO, the transplant center, the LB1 clinical staff, and the medical advisory team. Notice Toronto General Hospital. The UNOS number and blood type are verified in CMX, and a back table evaluation commences, noting organ condition. Perfusion takes place over a three to six hour period, during which the donated lungs are placed into a sterile plastic dome and attached to a ventilator, pump, and filters. The lungs are maintained at normal body temperature and treated with a bloodless solution that contains nutrients, proteins, and oxygen. Throughout this process, ongoing CMX documentation and assessment steps take place. These include bronchoscopy, x-rays, and blood gas analysis. During this period, our IT specialists facilitate visual and data communication with the transplant centers. Through our EVLP process, we are working to reduce the devastating effects of end-stage lung disease. So I'd like to mention is it says there are actually hundreds of people who otherwise would have died on the lung transplant list um, are now alive and living thanks to this technology out of Toronto General Hospital. So all Dr. Scalia's employees, correct? Correct. I'm going to, can you pause this for a, a moment? Receive the organ. Yeah, thank you. Uh, back. Yep, just pause for a second. Thanks. So um, I mentioned that uh, you see hundreds of lives have been saved. So already we're increasing the demand for helicopter delivery of lungs. And we're just making a small dent in the, in the need for these lungs. But the time of delivering organs by non-CO2 um, uh, producing methods, it's already begun. And it's not something which is uh, science fiction. A good friend of mine and uh, my colleague here, uh, Mikhail Cardinal, the uh, VP for, for this activity, uh, has already just uh, two weeks ago delivered the first uh, kidney for actual transplantation by a, a battery-powered uh, drone. And I'd like to show you a video of um, a true, actual, first-in-history delivery of an organ for transplantation by a vertical aircraft. Now you can begin the video. Dr. Scalia's employees, correct? Correct. Hommel's Hommel is functional. We're ready to receive the organ. Roger. And one last time, UMMC, Helipad, Clear, and CISCOM. And you guys are ready to receive the organ, correct? Accurate. It's cleared for launch. Let's make some history. Launch. We're launching. <laughs> Aircraft is airborne.
we want to prove that this can work, that we can safely transport an organ, even if it were a few short miles, safely, uh, you know, from, from point A to point B and, and reach that waiting recipient. Okay, this way, yeah, we're good. We have technologies now that allow the unmanned transportation of really any payload. And what we've done is try to innovate those systems to allow our patients better access to higher quality transplantable organs. I think the modes of transport, you know, should be expected to evolve over time, and this seems to be a natural evolution of, of how we transport things. Maintaining 91 meters altitude, 10 meters per second. We want to be part of that project and take it from this stage of short visual line of sight, and then someday working up to aircraft like this that will fly tens and hundreds, and again with a different aircraft, thousands of miles. Time in air, four minutes, 30 seconds. Approaching Martin Luther King, 100 meters. All right, aircraft has successfully landed. I'm disarming the vehicle. Oh, the vehicle has disarmed itself. I'm approaching the vehicle to hardware disarm. All right. Confirming Hommel's active. Temperature's appropriate. Organ doesn't appear to be injured at all. Looks like a perfectly transplantable organ. One small hop for a drone, <laughs> one major leap for medicine. This is a, a major step towards reinventing the way that the current system of organs are moved. And I think we help a lot of people this way. Might take a long time, but it's the first step. Go team. Awesome. <laughs> yep, so that was very, very exciting. Just exciting just within the past two weeks. This uh, vision that we have of greatly expanding the supply of transplantable organs and delivering them by some type of eVTOL craft, in this case, the first step with the drone. It's, um, I, I think it's past science fiction now. We are, in our company, actually manufacturing uh, organs, lungs. You saw the, the pictures of it. And other people are actually uh, delivering uh, these organs, in this case, a, a kidney for transplantation by uh, aviation, by e-aviation. Dr. Scalia is in place. OK. So before the end of the 2020s, we will uh, manufacture thousands of organs uh, personalized to the recipient's DNA, as I showed in the previous slide, and deliver them safely uh, via autonomous drone aircraft. And here is a video showing uh, more, more uh, color on the chart I gave at the beginning. 3D bioprinters at United Therapeutics Deco Organ Manufacturing Center in Manchester, New Hampshire print the inert collagen scaffold of a lung from its larger proximal vessels and bronchi to its millions of distal arterioles. End stage organ disease patients give up a few cells in a biopsy which will be transformed into inducible pluripotent stem cells, all matching the patient's DNA to avoid any need for immunosuppressants. It was just in the past decade that scientists learned how to turn differentiated human cells back into stem cells. Thereafter, the newly made stem cells can be re-differentiated back into a wide variety of different types of cells. In our manufacturing laboratories, we will re-differentiate newly made stem cells from a patient into endothelial, epithelial, muscle, and connective tissue cells that match the patient's DNA. After expanding the numbers of these differentiated cells into the tens of billions needed to cellularize each organ, we stream them into the previously bioprinted scaffold. The entire process of cell expansion and recellularization via streaming takes about two to three months per organ. At the end of the process, there is a newly manufactured, personalized organ that matches the DNA of the intended patient. Once removed from its bioreactor, the organ needs to be transplanted within hours. A transmedics cart will be loaded onto an EHANG manufactured organ transport helicopter or MOTH for delivery to the surgeon's operating room. And again, it's so amazing. I, you know, as mentioned, it will take us all of the 2020s to complete the immunosuppression free manufacture of, of personalized organs. Um, even then, there will be people who need an organ immediately who can't wait uh, for a couple months for them to be manufactured, such as they're in a terrible car accident or something like that. 
So the Xeno organs and the EVLP, all the other methods will still be used. But that uh, EHANG uh, drone aircraft that you, that you saw there, that's uh, not like just something that only exists in animation. That's already being uh, flown by the EHANG company. We are the uh, second largest uh, um, shareholder in that company. We placed an order for 1,000 of those drones to meet our specifications. And um, my colleague sitting with me at the table here, Mikhail Cardinal, is the very first uh, Canadian to have ever flown in that drone. <laughs> so <laughs> congratulations, Mikhail, on that. So the, uh, the next step for me was to be able to show that a uh, battery-powered helicopter, uh, heavy enough to carry a uh, medical staff, as well as uh, three or even four of these manufactured organs was possible with current technology. And what you're seeing there is the record-setting flight where uh, myself and my co-pilot, uh, Rick Webb, we, uh, we set the world record of, uh, of flying uh, in the 2,500-pound R44 with 1,000 pounds of uh, batteries. We, um, we flew a total of um, uh, time duration of, of uh, half hour and uh, about uh, 30 miles, uh, 800 feet. And so, so it's, uh, it's not just like an animation, it's not just a drone. This uh, vision that we have and plan that we have to create, um, manufacture hundreds of thousands of organs to deliver them all by eVTOL aircraft uh, without increasing a carbon footprint is, I think, something that we are very concretely proving with a proof of concept each and every step of the way, the organ manufacturing, drone delivery, and now the full-blown um, uh, electric helicopter. <clears throat> this chart uh, here um, is, um, addresses perhaps the most frequent question that I get asked. It's um, how are you going to be able to achieve a range comparable to what's achieved today with either fixed wing or rotary craft engines with batteries? Although at first I would say I received almost 100% uh, criticism, it will be impossible to even do that R44 demo. Uh, that you showed, and the batteries on that helicopter had about um, uh, over on 100 watt hours per kilogram. Um, people say, okay, half hour, that's, that's cute. Uh, you know, how about like a real mission? But in fact, what this chart shows is that the growth in energy density of, uh, of batteries is very, very predictable, very, very constant and it's about 7% a year. So the current batteries that are available for uh, aviation uh, will almost certainly uh, double in power within the next 10 years. Um, and in fact, I think uh, most experts in the industry would say that they'll do better than that. But very conservatively, they'll double in the next 10 years and double again in the uh, 10 years after that. That alone would provide a range uh, comparable with, with more than 90% of all helicopter missions. But then if you take into um, aerodynamic factors, um, such as improving the L over D of the, of the aircraft, and that's why there's so much excitement about eVTOL, because you're not trying to drag a helicopter through the air with a L over D of you know four, five, or six, instead, you're trying to bring something uh, with a much uh, sleeker uh, airfoil-driven uh, lift factor like a fixed-wing aircraft through the air. And uh, that's why there's so much excitement about eVTOLs. So you combine the superior uh, L over D of a fixed-wing aircraft uh, with the doubling every 10 years or better of the energy density. And I think that there is actually you know, very, very little doubt at all that uh, e-aviation will be able to handle um, the missions for organ delivery quite handily. 
Um, thousands of EV tolls delivering tens of thousands of organs and other payloads um, must also be very smart to avoid collisions. And um, I, I paid you know, sharp attention to the introductory remarks where it was noted that why are so many of our best and brightest minds graduating from college going into AI instead of into aeronautical engineering? But I think they're going to marry. I think they're going to become, you know, in many regards, almost one and the same. Because for us to accomplish this mission of delivering tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of organs, not to mention everybody else's missions, whether they be Amazon package delivery or, or uh, urban mobility, um, you're going to need an airspace that is much, much smarter than current airspace. But I do think that society's on track to have a smart enough AI uh, to achieve a mass scale uh, sense and avoid type of capability, which will be necessary for this EV toll vision to come um, to come to pass. Until then, uh, pilots are essential, and things in uh, in um, aviation navigation move slowly and deliberately as they should. So you're not going to see you know mass uh, aviation autonomy you know next year, and I doubt that you'll really even see it in the uh, 2020s. But by the 2030s, I think it's pretty predictable that you could have a, a mass number of autonomous aircraft flying. With regard to our own company, we have a much simpler mission that we can accomplish autonomously because there are in the US, and, and again, similar situation uh, kind of divided by 10 in, in Canada, there are only 100 hospitals in the United States that perform major transplant surgery. And because we are not rescuing organs from car accidents and, and, and minor hospitals all over the country, but instead we're sending them out like FedEx from a single manufacturing point, we have an, an exactly preset known flight path that we're flying all the time. And I feel fairly confident that we'll be able to pave the way for kind of mass autonomous aircraft uh, by doing uh, autonomous uh, beyond visual line of sight uh, delivery of organs because we're always will be flying the same path over and over again as a kind of a way to get your foot in the door on autonomous aviation. There are, there are people that wonder that uh, even with uh, AI, will we be able to be smart enough to, to keep um, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of flying things from bumping into each other and bumping into us? But I, I would like to kind of wrap up with this slide from my friend Ray, uh, Ray Kurzweil who has mapped the exponential growth in information technology. And I'm sure all of you have heard of Moore's, Moore's Law with the doubling of uh, processing speed every 18 to 24 months. So we're, we've accomplished a lot with AI with this doubling and our phones keep getting more and more amazing. I was very keen to hear that there's a session on um, 5G coming up at one of the panel. I mean, that's, that could not be possible without this rapid doubling of information technology. So if these projections are correct, and if we do um, have computational resources on the level of, of one human brain, or even you know, millions of human brains by the 2030s, then I think there isn't uh, much doubt that uh, handling the uh, air traffic safely would be accomplishable as well. So in summary, um, organ manufacturing um, is going to the, will lead to mass demand with real-time organ delivery. You can't put an organ sitting there on a shelf. Uh, once you get rid of the need for immunosuppression, it will go to a, a mass demand situation. EV toll has significant advantages for this, um, but if the only advantage was compliance with uh, regulations to reduce carbon footprint, that will be a, a definitive advantage for uh, EV toll over, um, over uh, gas turbines alone. Um, organ manufacturing and e-vertical delivery is, is not a, a science fiction concept. It's, it's actually happening right now in real life with real hardware. 
And exponential growth in information technology means that AI will be able to uh, handle the um, sense and avoid, collision avoidance, and navigation uh, requirements of e-vehicles. Thank you so much, and I'm so excited to now have some time to talk with Hafasi. Thank you very much, Dr. Rothblatt. Uh, this talk shows us two things. First, it reminds us why we are doing all this. We make nice aeroplanes, but in the end, is to make the life of people better. And this is one clear example of that. And uh, the second thing is it shows you that uh, technology is getting us to another place. So it will be my pleasure to ask a few questions of Martin, if you might. Um, we now, I, I believe, have uh, 10 minutes. So I will go straight to, uh, to the fact and remind people that you are investing in Quebec, in Bromont with Michael, and uh, developing there a vehicle uh, that will help with this transport. Now, the, the machine you're developing seems rather big. Uh, at least in the long run, do you see much smaller drones uh, in which these uh, organs and supporting equipment will just fit? Yes, it's a great question, Fossey. So first, I would say that we decided to headquarter our um, eVTOL development efforts in Beaumont because this area is um, pretty unique in the world in having a combined ecosystem of, uh, of knowledge and expertise in electrical power yeah. and in aviation. I, I think Hydro-Quebec is the best name in the world for electrical power, uh, with the roots going back a century, you know, to the, uh, to the very first generators. And um, that has spun off many companies and many engineers who are expert in uh, electrical power generally and, and mm -hmm. uh, battery storage of it in, in particular. There is the... Um, excellent think tanks here in Quebec that are the world's experts and in um, lith lithium ion and even next generation battery technology. A lot of people don't realize it, but um, a lot of the batteries that they have in their laptops and even in their uh, Tesla or other uh, electrical cars, it came from uh, research done at IREC uh, right here in, in uh, Quebec. And uh, with Denis. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I have the, been the honor to be there. It's yes. an amazing uh, uh, yes. place. And uh, secondly, I would just say it's obvious to everybody here that in terms of aviation, uh, Quebec is a leader in the world with uh, Bombardier and uh, Bell Helicopter. So I thought that if we uh, locate here, that we could um, attract the best and the brightest from the combined fields of uh, electrical power and aviation, which is needed for this project. I, um, I, I do think that uh, the uh, uh, Montrégie area, around where uh, Bromont is, is one of the nicest quality of life that you could ask for. So I was thought maybe there could be some really nice up and coming engineers who wanna raise their family in a more pastoral area and would yes, come to yes. Bromont. <laughs> And As to the, the size, yes. so um, it's a great question, uh, Fassi, and as shown in the video, uh, absolutely there will be drone delivery of uh, organs. There is already the, the first one drone delivery of an organ. A lady left the, that you saw in the video, she left the hospital, she's perfectly mm -hmm. fine. So, um, however, um, there, we should not really uh, underestimate the utility of people. It's like, yes, we could send a rover to the moon and to Mars, um, no doubt about it. They do a lot of good. But uh, humans are a tremendous multiplier. Uh, we are the, the greatest machine of all, you, you could say. And um, because it's my business to, to uh, provide organs and medicines to hospitals, I spend a lot of time in them. Uh, they are, to, in my opinion, among the, the hospitals are among the most disorganized and uh, complicated <laughs> uh, places that you can never go. I think many people would agree yeah, with you. Yeah, the corridors <laughs> go on forever, 
and um, I need to get, uh, if I could put uh, three organs on an on a EV toll, I need to have a person that's going to get the cart off and get it to the surgeon's table. And for the first one, everybody is sitting around waiting, taking videos. We're making yeah. history, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it gets to be the 100th and the 200th, the thing's going to be sitting there on the helipad, and everybody won't be waiting for it, and exactly. that's not good. Exactly. OK. So the, the first vehicle that you're doing, uh, will it be uh, uh, manned or unmanned, or uh, will be piloted first? Yeah, so we, we have actually some parallel programs. So yes. we have uh, an unmanned program yes. uh, using the EHANG helicopter. Mm -hmm. uh, or drone, if, whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, those will be doing their test flights in uh, Bromont. And we also hope to work with uh, Drone Delivery Canada, which is a, a very important uh, leader in this field. So we are doing the drones because we can fly them now, without a doubt. At the same time, to, deliver, to develop a manned uh, EV toll, it, of course, is a longer R&D uh, effort with uh, much more strenuous certification requirements. Yes. So we are doing that in parallel. And our goal is that uh, maybe when we are uh, delivering the first few hundred organs by drones and we're ready to step up to delivering in the thousands of organs, we can have our eVTOL certified for manned flight. So seeing from outside, things seem to be well planned and going. But uh, what are the roadblocks that you see in your way? Uh, any difficulties that you came across? There is always difficulties. Yes. I, I mean, if you want to do technology development, you are, you are signing up for setbacks, disappointments, difficulties. Um, this, is not, this is science, not theology. So you know, things are not going to like, be perfect. Exactly. <laughs> And, um, but we love that, it's a challenge. It's like if you try to climb a mountain, of course you're going to slip here and there and, and keep climbing. Yeah. I think the, um, the biggest uh, holdup will be some bureaucratic confusion because there are so many different players in this field and each of them are promoting their own standards and the, the government uh, uh, will have to decide what kind of uh, specifications and standards are appropriate to the industry, but it will be difficult because the industry is very diverse and has different interests. I do think that it's a positive step for the future that, um, that certification specifications are going more based on performance specifications um, as, a part to, as opposed to you know, specific product um, specifications. But the, the bureaucratic process uh, will be slow, um, but it's, it's okay because they're, they're there to do the right thing. And uh, we have to be patient, we have to be smart to work with them. In the end, we'll get there. The important thing for us engineers is not to give up. Exactly. And uh, I would like to say that uh, we are all watching carefully because the technologies that you're putting in motion with this purpose are really where the name of the game is today. And these are technologies that will affect all of us uh, in the future. So we'll be ready to welcome uh, Mikael and his, his first vehicle when, uh, when, there is, uh, when it starts flying. And I hope that we all remember on that day who are the forces behind all this realization. And this leads me to my last question. I think when we, when we read uh, your, your life story and the things you have achieved, uh, you are obviously uh, 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 an example to many of us and many people in the world. So which brings you back to what really is your inspiration and what are the, the people you look up to that inspire you hmm. that you could uh, uh, share with us? Well, first, Pasi, I look up to you. You've accomplished <laughs> like tremendous uh, amount in your life and you've made aviation safer and better for countless uh, thousands and millions so of people. So many people in this room. <laughs> so. I, I love life. I, I think it's, uh, it's it, you could never make a movie or, or write a book as good as life actually is. Mm -hmm. And to have the chance to come up with an idea, it's inside our head, to share that idea with, with other people, which means that we're each kind of doing a remote brain surgery with each other yeah. because we're sharing all of our neurons and our ideas 
and build together a project that ends up helping other people's lives be better. People who have an illness or an accident or any kind of problem, I, 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 I can never dream of anything better than life and that's what motivates me. And thank you very much for sharing with us and coming here. My pleasure.